Welcome back to Hashtag Sisters in Law with Jill Winebanks, Joyce Vance, Barb McQuaid, and me, Kimberly Atkins Store. And it is a very exciting and historical podcast for us and for all women. You know why? Because in the Sisters in Law merch store, we have a pale blue woman's tea. It is really a day to remember. It is just in time for spring. You really need to go to politicon.com slash merch and get yours now before they sell out. Today, we'll also be discussing another historic first, the nomination of Katanji Brown Jackson to the U.S. Supreme Court, the first Black woman to get that nod. We'll also talk about the New York prosecutors targeting Trump, who've quit over inaction, Barb's proposed prosecution memo, and the Texas governor's order that hormone treatments and other care for trans kids be treated as child abuse. And as always, we look forward to answering your questions at the end of the show. But first, I want to talk a little bit about what we saw when President Biden announced his nomination of Judge Jackson. One of the things she said that really resonated with me was how she was inspired by those before her, and particularly Judge Constance Baker Motley, with whom she she shares a birthday uh, and who was also uh, someone who was a first in so many ways as a black woman. And it made me think, who who are the people who inspired me? And I want to ask you all first, Joyce, who who comes to mind as someone who has inspired you in your life or career? You know, this is such a great question. I was thinking about it when I watched the judge make those comments, because it was a, a really nice moment in her introduction. And for me, the, the people that really matter the most, it's my law school roommates, so I'll give them a mm-hmm. shout out, Eva, Janie, Martha, Elizabeth, and, and Lisa. Um, you know, three years together is a long time in those formative years, and those are women in particular who I look to for inf- inspiration, but also because of that ability um, to always lift each other up, something that continues to, to this day. I, I've spoken with two of them um, this morning. And I feel that constant level of support and, and the ability to achieve things that maybe seemed a little bit of uh, a piece that was out of reach when you have that sort of unconditional support from people who you've known from way back. That is so what sweet. You, you know, since you're going to name your law school roommates, I have to name Sarah, Jean, Lisa, Lynn, and Janice um, <laughs> as mine too. That's great. I'm actually going to go a little further back. And, you know, I'm sure like all of you, there's so many people that we feel like we owe who have inspired us, fa- our family members, you know, parents, mentors, bosses, other people along the way. But you know, someone who inspired me, I was trying to think back to like my earliest inspiration. And it was a woman whose name you probably don't know. Her name was Carolyn King. And I remember this vividly. As a kid, she was a girl who wanted to play Little League Baseball in Ypsilanti, Michigan. And so I was in about third grade, and she was a little older. I think she was 12. And the Ypsilanti Little League allowed her to play, but the Little League National Charter in Pennsylvania said they were they were going to uh, strip Ypsilanti of their charter if they allowed a girl to play. So it went to court and all kinds of things. And I can remember asking my mom, like, why, why, why won't they let her play? And her explaining to me that there were these rules that prohibited girls from doing certain things. And I've I've always, from that moment on, just thought, this is not the America I was told I lived in. I was told we can do anything in this country. And I was so offended at that, that I think it has really inspired me all my life to fight against any example of discrimination or inequality, because that is not what America is supposed to be. So Carolyn King, here's to you. How about you, Jill? Well, my list is really mm-hmm. long. And after I thought about it and listening to you, I was like, I really need to limit it, but I really can't. And mine is not just women who have inspired me or girls, because some of them were when I was quite young. Um, but Nancy Dickerson was one of the first professional women that I ever saw. She was one of the first women on TV. And that inspired me to think that I could make journalism a career. Uh, Tony Lewis, who was a New York Times columnist, inspired me by uh, having gone to law school and being a great journalist at the same time to follow that path to journalism. My father, uh, at least two of my bosses, uh, Chuck Ruff, um, and then the Attorney General of Illinois. Uh, My seventh grade teacher, who taught me a really important lesson about having the confidence to vote for yourself, not being a pushy, bad thing to do. That even if you're female and you're raised to think that you can't do that, that if you're running for an office, you have to 
be able to vote for yourself. And that was a really good lesson. My aunt, my dad's client, who was the first woman I knew who had a job that wasn't teaching or nursing, uh, she was an occupational therapist my first year of college. That's what I majored in, in following her. And then I have to mention two groups of very special friends, um, I guess three groups. One is known as the bridesmaids, because we were all bridesmaids to a particular bride and have been very close for more than 20 years since. Um, the Quince, which is five of us who talk every week about politics. And the other are my sorority sisters from way more than 50 years ago, who we still get together every year. And we're planning a trip um, this May, this time back in person again for the first time in a couple of years. And they have all really, as, as Joyce said, they've lifted me up and they've propped me up and they've given me the confidence to do the things that I do. So all of those have inspired me to be who I am. And for me, and for, well, first I need to <laughs> shout out the Wolfpack. You know who you are. I love you guys from law school. Um, but when I was thinking about this, it made me think of who I had as a child to look up to um, and who helped inspire and make me the person who I am. And you know, aside from my parents and my family, the one person who stood out was my fifth grade teacher. Her name was Miss Wyndham. And she was a black woman. She was from the South. She was very proud. And she taught us to be very proud. She taught each and every one of her students that we had the ability to do anything we wanted to do. And particularly the black students that we are just as smart and just as capable as anyone else. She taught us in a way that wasn't scary that we would face obstacles or we would necessarily face people who would tell us otherwise. And that was why she informed, she made it, she made sure that we knew that we could and that we had the power and the right to stand up for ourselves. You know, she was the person who taught me the lyrics to lift every voice. She was the person who really instilled that kind, the first person outside of my family that really instilled that kind of pride in me. And that is the same kind of pride that struck at my heart listening to Judge Jackson today. And so I thought of her. So I'm very grateful for her. And so let's talk more about Judge Jackson. Well, exciting news about President Biden's pick for the Supreme Court, Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson. In January, President Biden promised to nominate someone, he said, quote, with extraordinary qualifications, character, experience, and integrity. And that person will be the first black woman ever nominated to the United States Supreme Court. Uh, and on Friday, we did see President Biden nominate Katanji Brown Jackson to the U.S. Supreme Court, the first African-American woman ever to that post. She gave, I thought, some very gracious remarks. And I noticed, Joyce, I, I don't know about you, that when she was introduced, President Biden had to pull out a little stool for her to stand on behind the podium uh, to, so that she could see over the top. And I know you and I have shared those moments as well. So she not only am I impressed with her credentials, but she won my heart uh, in that moment. Uh, it, 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 how did you feel about that? I felt very seen. You know, it reminded me of um, <laughs> the 11th Circuit where my father-in-law, who was six foot five, was a judge. And the judges, when they came out for en banc, would walk out in terms of their seniority. And the judge who came behind my father-in-law was Phyllis Kravitch, a mighty woman from Savannah, Georgia, who was five foot one when she stretched tall. And so seeing her standing and sitting next to Bob was always funny. And, and she actually confided in me at one point and told me she had to sit on a telephone book <laughs> before they actually made a chair that would accommodate her. So I hope that Judge Brown Jackson, that somebody will make her her own special chair. She deserves to be seen. Well, Joyce, let me ask you if you can just tell us a little bit about Judge Jackson, a little bit about her background and who she is. Okay, we'll stop the presses. I learned the most important thing about her just as we were starting the podcast. She's a knitter. Ah. So I, oh. I mean, I think that just does it, right? It's done. Knitters, we vote. We tend to be um, <laughs> liberal. And I think that any senator who fails to vote to confirm her really does so at the risk of activating the knitters in their state to vote <laughs> against them next time they're up. So just a word of warning to 
to senators. Um, but the country, obviously, for everyone who saw her today, and I, I know that they'll play parts of it back over the news all night, probably all weekend. She's obviously a really extraordinary woman and a highly qualified jurist. She led with her faith. She led with her family. Um, and something that I note in her background is that she's really proof, um, it, as if we needed any more, about the importance of teachers in our community. Both of her parents are teachers, and that clearly plays a big role in helping her advance her career, even to the point um, uh, you know, of being told by a high school guidance counselor that she shouldn't set her sights as high as Harvard, even though she was a star student. But here she is today, and, and everybody who's been influenced like Kim has by a teacher knows what important roles she plays. So, so look, there's no question that she's qualified for this job. She's probably more qualified than the last 10 nominees to the court. She has experience as a federal trial judge, which is incredibly important. That's, that's experience that is all too rare on the Supreme Court. And it's easy to reverse a federal judge if you've never sat in their shoes. But I think that we need more of that experience among our appellate judges and particularly on the Supreme Court. She clerked for Justice Breyer before she uh, began her professional career, so she knows her way around the Supreme Court. And something that seems to me to be really important is that she will be the first justice, if she's confirmed, since Thurgood Marshall, who has experience doing criminal defense work. And hers is very sophisticated. She worked for the Federal Defender's Office in the District of Columbia. She did some appellate work in that area. And, and these issues are difficult and they're nuanced. That doesn't suggest that she will be pro-defendant. It just means that she'll have the ability to bring to the court's conferences a more 360-degree view of the issues involved and how those issues should play out. So I think that matters a lot. Um, also, as, a, as an appellate lawyer who did a lot of sentencing work and knows that many sentencing issues make their way to the court, I think it's important that she's served on the Sentencing Commission, which is this sort of obscure commission in government that helps to craft and keep updated the guidelines that federal judges use when they sentence defendants in criminal cases. And that means that here again, she'll have this very sophisticated understanding. You know, this is almost like the tax code trying to wade through the guidelines. And other than just the mechanics of the guidelines, there are issues of constitutionality and when defendants can be held accountable for conduct that they're not convicted of. So lots of really difficult and almost arcane issues there that she'll be well-suited to, to take on. How did I know you, you know, were going to mention has, the guidelines? You're such a guidelines wonk. You know, Trace. right? I'm such a guidelines up. geek. <laughs> but um, seriously, it matters, right? Because oh, yeah, there yeah. are plenty of people with prosecutorial Absolutely. backgrounds on the court. Sotomayor and Alito, uh, Justice Kagan was the Solicitor General. So, uh, you know, I think her viewpoints, I mean, obviously, this is an incredible moment where little black girls can look up and say, I want to be a, a judge, just like Barb McQuaid could look up and say, you know, I want to play ball. Mm -hmm. um, and that's very real. And I don't think that we should underestimate the importance that that might have. The, the girl sitting out there who's going to see Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson on television tonight and be inspired to a, a better future, a, a future that improves all of us and lifts up the country. Um, but boy, I, I think that we're off to a tremendous start here. She's just something else. Yeah. And you know what else I think about that? You know, for sure, she becomes a good role model for um, young black girls to see someone like them. But I think every time you break one of those barriers, it's good for everybody. I can remember being in high school and a teacher pointing out that there had never been a president who wasn't a white male, but not just any white male who had kind of a waspy last name. You know, he said, so, hey, you kids, Kowalski and... Uh, 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 you know, Ranzini, forget about it. it, it it's not a job for you. Um, and I, I don't think he was trying to discourage him, but I think he was trying to point out a reality in our country. And so I think anytime a barrier is broken, it opens the possibilities for everybody. I mean, I remember crying the night Barack Obama was uh, appointed because it just, or elected president because it just meant our country had embraced this idea that diversity matters and that everybody is welcome uh, at the highest levels of our government. Um, so I think it's a great day for everybody to see her appointed uh, to the bench. Kim, let me ask you, you've covered the Supreme Court for a long time, so you're a courthouse insider. And in addition to that, you've spent your career as, uh, in Biden's word, an extraordinary lawyer, who is also an African-American woman. 
what what does this nomination mean to you and for our country? Yeah, no, it's super important. You know, before I get into that, just talking about um, people in height, one of my favorite <laughs> things that I witnessed as a reporter covering the U.S. Supreme Court is when Elena Kagan was Solicitor General. Now, keep in mind, she when she clerked for Thurgood Marshall, um, Justice Marshall nicknamed her Shorty. Um, but so when she was Solicitor General, there is the podium at the U.S. Supreme Court where you go to argue before. It. There's actually an electric um, button that you can push that raises and lowers it. Mm-hmm. But most of the people who argue are men who are, you know, roughly somewhere around six feet. So that it never moved. So when she stood up, first of all, it was slow. So she pushed this button and it felt <laughs> like it took forever for this podium to lower so that the justices could actually see her. And because it didn't happen very much, because of the microphone on it, this popping sound would happen as like, you know, the cords that you could tell hadn't been moved in like 20 years were like moving. And it was like this (laughs) popping electronic noise. And she would just stand there, you know, just very poised and wait for this thing (laughs) to come down every time she argued. And it was absolutely hilarious. Anyway, um, so uh, thinking about all of the people under 5'4 who uh, are important to the U.S. Supreme Court. But yes, this is really important. Look, there, it is a 6-3 conservative court. So one thing that is very different about a Justice Jackson when she enters this court that's different from even a, a Justice Sotomayor or Justice Kagan when they entered is they entered a, a court that was 5-4 with some people in the majority still interested in building consensus. So it gave them the opportunity to try to go in and and try to make that, um, you know, get the victories where they could and try to limit the impact of uh, imp- opinions that they disagreed with and try to push and pull and and keep things together. That's how we got things like the uh, the decision upholding Obamacare. That's how we got things like decisions that even if they cut away at affirmative action, didn't kill it completely. Justice Jackson will be entering this court in a completely different way. It is already 6-3, and they have already gone gangbusters, frankly, in taking on every— you know, Look what they're doing just this term, gun rights, um, you know, abortion, um, next term, coming up with affirm- affirmative action, voting rights, um, immigrate. I mean, they're just going right at it. And so she's coming in as a dissenter. That will be her job, to be a dissenter. She's not, although Biden says she has a history of building consensus, she does. That's not what's going to happen on this. So that's going to make her job so much harder as a new justice than just about anybody else that has been put on this court in a generation. And so what I am hoping is that she uses that power strongly. Yes, talks to people in that conference, talks to the other justices when they decide cases to give a perspective that is different, different not just as a Black woman, but as a former uh, public defender, as somebody who understands sentencing, as somebody who grew up in a place like Miami, uh, where there are a lot of people who look very different than the other people on that court, um, and brings that and at least tries to make them understand, even if her biggest external power is in those dissents. So I'm hoping when she writes those dissents that it's for the ages, that it's for the future, that it's for the people who she said she wants to inspire in the future, um, and that she does that job well. Yeah, and you know, uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg had often said that you know part of a big part of her work was writing dissents, but uh, as she said, a dissent is you know not for today; it's for the future, and sometimes. The, the dissent from last decade can become the majority opinion in the future. Uh, I know there is a largely cited uh, concurring opinion from Justice Sonia Sotomayor about privacy that in 2012 was seen as, you know, just sort of a, an aside and dicta um, and has now become the heart of a lot of privacy decisions. So, um, you know, taking the long view, writing for the ages, she's only 51, so let's hope she's on the court for uh, decades to come and she'll have a chance to, uh, you know, make her mark in that way. Jill, speaking of history, let me ask you, you've seen history on the court. Um, when you started practicing law, you've talked about the fact how there were so few women. And in fact, by the way, Jill, I should mention that speaking of people who've been inspired and, and, and by whom they've been inspired, I hear from so many people that they were inspired to become lawyers because of you, people who I know who are judges, who became judges because of you and seeing you in your work during Watergate. But um, when you became a lawyer, there were no women at all on the Supreme Court, right? Sandy O'Connor didn't come along until the 1980s. Um, And so uh, we didn't get a Latina till the 2000s. And now finally we have uh, the first uh, African-American woman judge on the court. 
Um, what do you think is the significance of this appointment? I think that we've talked about some of them already, which is, of course, it is inspirational to other people who look like her. So little black girls can now look ahead and say, well, I look just like that judge. That's an important thing. Um, but it's also her skills that I think are going to make a difference. And part of it is she's very much known for building bridges and for being able to get compromise. And so that maybe the 6-3 court becomes a 5-4 court, at least, because she can bring along one of the six to the positions that the more liberal justices are espousing and trying to fight for. Um, it is, you know, when I started practicing law, and to me the most important thing is opening doors to other women, to having my successor as general counsel of the Army be another woman, because that means that you didn't mess up too badly that they said, oh, we can never hire another woman because they just can't do the job. Um, and I think that seeing all these women now, when I started, only 4% of all lawyers were women. And wow. we were made fun of. We were definitely bullied. Yeah. Um, uh, horrible sexism and discrimination, all of which was legal at the time. You know, there was no Title IX. There was no EEOC. There was no Ms. Magazine. I mean, there was nothing that protected the women who went into law. And so it is important now. And, you know, there's a rule that says there have to be at least three on any group to have an impact, whether it's a corporate board or a court. And uh, having more than three would be even better, or as Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg says, there'll be enough when there are nine. And I look forward to that day. But adding a woman and adding, uh, and, you know, the, the color issue becomes complicated to me because Justice Thomas is also a black justice but does not represent any views that I would ever want to be the predominant views of the court. So she will bring a different set of experiences and views. So I think she's really an important historic addition. And for any, any advocate who appears now before the Supreme Court, they're gonna have to take very seriously, not just white men as justices, but women and people of color. So I think it's an important step. Yeah, you know, when um, Joe Biden, by the way, I think it was two years ago to the day I heard today that he made this campaign yes, promise yes. to nominate the court's first ever African-American woman. Um, initially, when he made this announcement that that is, you know, he, he, what he planned to do in January, it was met with a lot of criticism. We heard a lot of things about, you know, reverse discrimination or, um, you know, how this was uh, identity politics or something like that. And it seems like that died down pretty quickly. What What do you think about that, Joyce? Do you have any theories as to why that died down quickly? It just didn't seem to, to really, um, you know, uh, have legs, as they say. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that they're sandbagging it. I mean, it was only remarkable in the first place, right, that Biden announced he'd pick a black woman because for so many years it was clear you didn't have to say who you were picking from. It was always going to be a waspy white dude um, or, or at least a white guy. Um, I'll, I'll give deference to Justice Scalia there. Uh, uh, but, you know, the notion that this is something that smacks of re reverse discrimination, and I think one of the reasons it stopped, is that it just doesn't fly when you're picking from among a highly qualified group that has been explicitly yeah. passed over for far too long. Uh, but that doesn't mean the, that we've heard the last of it. Mm -hmm. I expect it's going to raise its ugly little head again soon. Interesting. I, I mean, you know, the, it, it's perfectly lawful. There has been uh, a lot of case law on this in higher education in particular, that um, affirmative action is permissible. Uh, racial preferences are permissible when they are narrowly tailored to achieve a compelling governmental interest. And the Supreme Court itself has held that diversity is a compelling governmental interest. But it could very well be. Wait till next Well, I know. I was just going to say, it, it could very well be <laughs> that the court reexamines that doctrine. What do you think about that, Kim? We'll have, uh, you know, this this justice on the court reviewing that that very uh, principle. What Do you think it's in danger? Yeah. Yes. I mean, that's one of the cases that 
that explicitly that I'm talking about. I mean, that that w- that is on the docket already for next term. Yeah. So if she is con- confirmed, that case will be on. And we have seen this court chip away and chip away at that doctrine until it was held together by its very threads. It's literally holding on for dear life yeah. uh, it, to be permissible. And that's only because of uh, Justice uh, Anthony Kennedy, who is gone. So I think that that is um, that a lot of justices have expressed antipathy toward it. Yeah. Among them, uh, Clarence Thomas, yeah, yeah. who himself was a beneficiary of it. But if you read his, uh, if you read his um, autobiography, he sees it as insulting, even though he got a scholarship to Holy Cross, mm-hmm. even though you know he was appointed to replace Thurgood Marshall. Do we think that that was purely accidental? Um, but he sees the idea that someone helped him as insulting, as opposed to saying there is systemic there is systemic discrimination in this world that we have to do what we yeah. can to eradicate it and to make sure that people have that chance that a little boy from pinpoint Georgia who grew up poor like him has a shot at the U S Supreme court. So it's, it's quite remarkable. And I think there may be a difference between affirmative action and diversity on the court as a benefit in and of itself. And when we talked about diversity on one of these episodes and in the context of the Supreme Court, it is diversity of background um, so that we have, for example, someone who has defense, criminal defense experience. We have someone who's from Miami. Now, uh, Justice Jackson Brown did go to an Ivy League school, um, but we did have candidates who didn't, and that would have brought a new kind of diversity. And I think that those are important facts so that we're not just talking about this as affirmative action. It wasn't. It was a recognition that a diverse court will better represent and come to better conclusions on behalf of the people of America. And that's what this appointment means. Yeah, and which I think is the the bedrock of all affirmative action programs, right? At universities, a recognition that it benefits all students to have diversity in the classroom. You know, I think it comes from, frankly, a fairly selfish place of saying, I don't want to be the victim that, you know, I was the one who was rejected. Um, but if there is a better societal good that comes from diversity, then that is that compelling governmental interest that is narrowly tailored to achieve it. So um, one other piece of uh, uh potential criticism, I think, or challenge. You know, there is this um, uh, push, probably from the left as much as the right, that um, the court has been occupied too much by elites, people who went to Ivy League schools. um, And now we also have a candidate who was uh, herself a Supreme Court clerk for the very justice she is replacing, just as Kavanaugh replaced Kennedy, you know, this whole insider's club that it's all too clubby. Um, what do you think is the appropriate response to that if people say uh, she's an elitist, uh, you know, she's part of this uh, this tiny little um, fraternity of, uh, of elites? What, what's the right response there? What do you think, Joyce? Well, I think... First off, it's it's just not true, right? This is not somebody who was born with a silver spoon in her mouth and she worked hard to get where she is. So I think this is a, a case where we've got somebody who fully merits every place she is. But but I agree with Jill really strongly. I mean, I think it's a problem that the court is mostly populated by denizens of, of Yale and Harvard. And I think that we would be better off if the court looked more like, you know, the more broadly based 50 state um, legal community that we really have. It would have been unfair, though, to the first black woman nominated to the court to make her also shoulder that burden right. of, you know, pushing Well, I was just about that, to say, so. I, I, right. I don't think that there are people who will never consider me elite. If I went to every Ivy League school on earth, like they would never see me. That's meant to apply to a certain group of folks. And I don't think she's one of them. Today's episode is sponsored by Honey. And if you don't know what Honey is, you really should. It's a way to save a lot of money on products that you buy online. And we all shop online and can't help feeling it when the promo code box taunts us at checkout. But thanks to Honey, manually searching for coupon codes is a thing of the past. Honey is the free shopping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one it finds to your cart. They support over 30,000 stores online, with everything from tech to popular fashion brands and even food delivery. 
And so far, Honey has found it's over 17 million members, more than $2 billion in savings. How does it work, Kim? You know, it works really well. Just to ask my husband. He's like, you're always getting these boxes of deliveries. And, you know, and I was trying to cut down on my shopping. But, you know, honey makes it so easy. So I, I may or may not have a pair of shoes en route to the house right now. We'll see. But you should try it, too. So imagine you're shopping on one of your favorite sites. And when you check out, the honey button drops down. And all you have to do is click apply coupons. And then you wait for a few seconds. It's not even that. As Honey searches for the coupons that could be used for that site. And boom, you see the prices drop. It's so easy. If you don't already have Honey, you are straight up missing out. It's literally free and installs in a few seconds. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting this podcast. We'd never recommend something we don't use. Get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash sisters. That's joinhoney.com slash sisters, or look for the link in our show notes. You won't be sorry. Last week, Trump seemed to be on the ropes. New York's attorney general won a court order that will let her depose the former president, and a civil action against him in the District of Columbia is moving forward. But then there was sudden news this Wednesday that two experienced prosecutors in the Manhattan DA's office, the lawyers who've been handling the criminal investigation into the former president, that they had suddenly resigned. To many former federal prosecutors, that read like a clear signal that the district attorney had put the kibosh on seeking an indictment and that the prosecutors resigned in protest. But we don't know for sure because, at least so far, no one has offered a definitive version of what happened. So, Kim, let me turn to you first. What do you think happened in New York City? What's the latest reporting on the Manhattan DA's criminal investigation? And how do you interpret the future, what the future has in store for this work that's been going on in Manhattan for more than three years now? Well, I, I, you know, listen, there are things that we know and things that we don't know at this point. And I will call those, uh, you know, the, the known unknowns <laughs> with, uh, to paraphrase um, uh, Donald Rumsfeld. So what we know is that Carrie Ardun and Mark Pomerant submitted their resignations. And it was reported that they did so because uh, D.A. Bragg uh, said that he was unsure about whether to move forward with a criminal case against Donald Trump for fraud. And that's really all that we know. What we don't know is whether, we don't know what Bragg will do, that he hasn't made that announcement yet. We don't know if there was a disagreement between Bragg and these prosecutors, if they quit in in protest or if their jobs came to an end because the the part of the the work they were doing had naturally ended. We don't know if there is a lot of there there. So this isn't that surprising to me. This investigation has been going on for three years. Um, It started with Cy Vance and it's still ongoing. It seems to me, yes, thorough investigations do take time. We've talked about that. I think three years is on the excessively long side. And I think that there were already, probably already signs uh, that this that there may be problems with this by way of the fact that we hadn't seen charges yet. So I'm not an expert here. This didn't surprise me that much. Um, Of course, these resignations, that's a good headline. But I think we need to learn a lot more before we have any definitive answers. Yeah, you know, we had discussed the fact that in parallel proceedings, which is what this was to some extent, having civil and criminal cases proceeding at the same time, that it was unusual to see the civil case go ahead of the criminal one. And yet Letitia James is further along than the Manhattan DA had appeared to be. And so this this may be those chickens coming home to roost. Um, But Jill, like Kim says, we don't know for certain. But what do you think this means for the Manhattan DA's investigation? Do you think it's at an end? When I first read about the resignations, I thought for sure that's what it meant. But then when you take a step back and you think about, well, what are all the possible explanations of why they quit? Uh, A number come to mind. I mean, it could be because they wanted to prosecute and Bragg didn't. It could have been because of reporting that we now are reading that he, that Uh, the new DA Bragg was just not interested that he would take phone calls and do texting while he was in meetings with them about the case. Um, It could be 
that he wanted to go ahead and they didn't. It could have been because there was some investigative technique that they wanted to use and he wouldn't let them or that he wanted them to use and that they didn't want. So there's a lot of different reasons. But the thing that really made me change my mind and say, well, maybe it's not over, is that he has appointed Susan Hoffinger, who is a very experienced attorney, um, to now take over the case. So he hasn't just shut it down. The two who quit were the people who've been working on it the longest. And I know from my experience in Watergate, when Archie Cox got fired, we thought about quitting in protest over his firing. And it wasn't clear whether we had also been fired. But Archie said to us, if you can keep on doing your job, you must stay. You know the case, and it would be too big a loss to have you then leave. Then he's getting exactly what he wants, he being President Nixon. So you can't quit. So it is a big loss to lose Dunn and Pomerantz, who know the case. But the fact that there is someone new taking over means it hasn't shut down completely. On the other hand, uh, supposedly Vance, the predecessor DA, was ready to indict, and they didn't. And he left office, he didn't run for re-election, and nothing's happened. So I, there's part of me that says, yes, it's over, and there's a part of me that wants to hold out hope and to hope that it's more than just a civil case. At this point, I'm happy with a civil case, but I would like it to be a criminal case. Yeah, it's really interesting. You know, the New York DA, or rather the Manhattan DA, still has to go ahead with the trial for Alan Weisselberg and the Trump Organization. So, of course, he has to have another prosecutor step into the shoes of the two that departed. But I think you're right. We'll have to keep an eye on this one and see whether there's any movement with Weisselberg as a witness. It seems to me like uh, they tried really hard to flip him and, and just weren't successful. And now he and the organization will go to trial. And whether anything develops that could uh, advance a criminal case, I think, is, is open. But Barb, you wrote a piece this week about another potential criminal matter, the possible prosecution of Donald Trump for insurrection and events around January 6th. Can you lay out your argument for us? Yeah, I drafted a little prosecution memo um, alleging What's that— What's a prosecution oh, memo, that's good. Barb? So a prosecution memo, as you know, Joyce, is a kind of document that a prosecutor writes at the Department of Justice so that a supervisor or someone higher in the chain of command can look at the whole case. You summarize the evidence and you make a recommendation as to whether there is sufficient evidence to obtain and sustain a conviction, and also talking about potential defenses and whether it would serve a substantial federal interest to bring charges. And so I wonder, you know, what, what might that look like if you were to prepare such a thing? You know, there's been a lot of question, is DOJ investigating or are they not? And so uh, I thought, well, let's just put together all of the evidence that is out there in the public domain to see if there is sufficient evidence there. And I, I focused on a couple of statutes. One was conspiracy to defraud the United States by obstructing in the uh, certification of the president. Uh, and the other was obstructing an official proceeding, which was that January 6th proceeding where Mike Pence was to count the, the votes. And I did not link any of it to the, the physical attack on the Capitol. Uh, it may be yet that there is evidence to link uh, President Trump to deliberately conspiring with people to have that physical attack. But at the very least, I think we can show that he did try to pressure Mike Pence to abuse his authority as vice president by uh, thwarting that counting process on January 6th. Trump made public statements um, vocally at the ellipse. He tweeted about it. Uh, there's reporting that they had private meetings about it. So we know what he did. And so to me, what it all comes down to is the question of intent. Did he know that he did not win the election, that all of this effort was based on a lie, that you know, Joe Biden did legitimately win the election and all this stuff about stop the steal was made up. And so how do you prove that? So I just went out and just tried to collect all the evidence that's in the public domain to prove that he knew that there was no there there. And it's actually a pretty interesting list and it's a pretty overwhelming list. By January 6th, he knows from um, his DHS cybersecurity chief, these are all his own appointees, by the way, Chris Krebs, um, William Barr has made public statements that there's no fraud. His director of national intelligence, John Ratcliffe, has made a statement. He's got an internal campaign memo that says there's no fraud. 
He's lost 61 out of 62 lawsuits all around the country, including some judges he appointed himself. The only one his campaign won related to some affidavits that had no bearing on the election count. Um, And uh, Brad Raffensperger, the Secretary of State of Georgia, has told him there's no fraud. And in fact, when he pushed back on the Justice Department successors to Barr, who told him there is no fraud, we can't make it up. He says, just um, say there's fraud and leave it to me to do the the rest. And when they said, no, there's simply no fraud, and he wanted to send letters to all these states asking them to convene their legislatures to throw out their electors, there was a threat of a mass resignation by DOJ lawyers and by White House lawyers. And Joyce, did you know, I only knew this once I delved into it, they were going to send, they had sent an email to the co-chairs of the AGAC saying, you should decide for yourselves whether you want to resign, but this is what we're doing and why. You know, you know that they would have sent that to all 93 U.S. attorneys. And so imagine what that mass resignation would have looked like. And only then did Trump back down from this plan to fire Rosen and appoint Clark to follow through on this part with uh, with the, the state legislators. But nonetheless, he persists still on January 6th and keeps pressuring Mike <laughs> Pence to subvert the election. And so to me, that is overwhelming evidence that he knew that there was no there there. In fact, as one court said, there was not a scintilla of evidence. There's no evidence whatsoever. This is just made up. And so I think based on all that evidence, it seems to me that they can obtain and sustain a conviction. The harder question is whether they want to go down this road. And I think the only thing worse than going down this road is not doing it and holding him accountable. You know, nobody ever says, thank God for the lawyers. <laughs> um, but when you think about it, we really do owe an awful lot to the lawyers in yeah. this country and to other people in government. Y- you know, I like your article, and, and we'll put a link to the piece in the show notes so everybody can read it. It's a tremendous piece at Just Security, which is an online sort of a legal venue. Um, I, I like the piece a whole lot, and I think it's worth pointing out that you make the case just based on the publicly available evidence. You don't have subpoena power. You can't look at people's phone records. The evidence is undoubtedly better in many ways than what you had to work with, and yet you make a really good case. So, Kim, you're the reporter among us. What do you think is going on at DOJ? Aren't they or aren't they? Is it go or no go for Merrick Garland? I wish I knew. Listen, I'd have the Pulitzer if I knew the answer to that. I I really don't know. Listen, my gut, um, you know, we've talked about this before. I was among those who, um, among those of us who had grown quite impatient with the DOJ and what they were going to do. I was um, sort of eased a little bit when the seditious conspiracy charges were brought against the Oath Keepers, uh, although some of them had already been charged with other things. Those additional charges, it seemed like maybe there was a crescendo uh, that could be leading up to something. But after Barb's memo, um, I, I you can read it either way, right? Either that, okay, so the DOJ has to know this. Like, the, they have to understand this. So something must be going on. There must be a, a chance, a, an imperative that um, this needs to be pursued. On the other hand, um, you know, there is the, there is the, that's a big step. And perhaps there is some hesitancy by some at the top to, to charge a former president. I honestly don't know. I wish I did. Yeah, don't we all? I mean, but I agree with Barb's conclusion. The only thing worse than prosecuting a former president would be not doing it in, in this situation. I agree. Um, Jill, what, what do you think? Is there sufficient evidence? I mean, it, it seems clear when you just look at, you know, what we saw in the news, it looks easy, but that's not how it works for prosecutors. There's this usual caveat that we always talk about. There has to be sufficient admissible evidence for the government to prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt. So do you think they can get there? Yes. Um, Let me go back a ways. As someone who was in a position to try to indict a sitting president— and then for a brief moment, a chance to indict a former president in the approximate few weeks after he resigned until he got pardoned. And I think that indicting, I I, I agree with Barbara, the worst thing is to let someone get away with it. You set a pattern. I think that if Richard Nixon had been indicted, maybe there would have been a lesson for Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And maybe we wouldn't be in the mess that we are in. And um, I can also relate that to Putin. We let him get away with taking Crimea, and now he's taken much more. So 
Um, do I think there's enough evidence? I can also go back to when I first, first appeared on MSNBC back in 2017. And Brian Williams asked me about, do you think you could make an obstruction case? And this related back then to uh, the Russia investigation. And I said, yes. Well, I have an even stronger yes to many crimes now. So when you ask, you know, do I think that there is sufficient evidence to prosecute Trump? Uh, I'm going to broaden it beyond DOJ and say that in addition, I mean, I think the Fulton County investigation is a likely possibility. The New York Attorney General is not an indictment, but it could be a civil case. Um, and we understand that our friend Mimi Roca in Westchester County has a investigation going of his mishandling and um, financial wrongdoing at his golf course in Westchester County. The tax audit, what's going on with the tax audit? Nobody's tax audit takes that long and he's been out of office for a year. So, okay, they didn't investigate while he was in office, but either he committed tax fraud or he didn't. It should be announced that it's over or he should be charged with having to repay the, the money. Um, violating his duty that the laws be faithfully executed and that he was interfering with Congress doing its constitutional duties, those are crimes. Those are things that I think the evidence seems pretty clear on. There's a good case for his being an accomplice to the insurrection, to the violence and the destruction uh, there. And so I think there's a whole lot of crimes that DOJ and other entities could bring. There are cases pending um, in addition to criminal ones, but I think we need to get this moving and there is a difference between knowing he did something and being able to prove it by admissible evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. But I believe based on what is publicly known, and I'm assuming that for everything we know, it's the tip of the iceberg and there's much more proof, um, that the answer to your question is yes, there's sufficient evidence. And the fact that nothing has leaked makes me think that they're doing nothing and that I'm hoping they read Barbara's piece. Um, you know, <laughs> at least three of us have written press memos uh, many, many times, and hers is a really good one. If I was the Attorney General of the United States, I would say, okay, we don't have to prove all of the cases that are possible. Let's go with this one. Let's take this one first. And then while we're there, you, we can do the others. So thank you, Barbara, for showing Merrick Garland the way. Please. Attorney General, read this press <laughs> memo. Hey, so, um, Barb, kidding aside, why do you think prosecutors aren't more uh, aggressive about Trump? Is there, is there a good reason to lie low or no? Well, I think one of the reasons is not the can you charge, but should you charge prong, you know, that we've talked about before. I think uh, there are some risks to charging a former president. One is just setting the precedent that you charge people after they've left office. I, I, you know, you can imagine the way this could be abused in the future once you set this precedent. A future President Trump using his Justice Department to charge uh, a, a Joe Biden or Hillary Clinton for, you know, made up charges based on politics. Uh, or there is uh, the risk you could lose. There is the risk that uh, you will be criticized for using the Justice Department to uh, achieve some partisan political end. Uh, so I think those are all potential negatives, especially when you have Merrick Garland, who I think was selected for this position in large part because not only is he a very smart lawyer with great experience in the D Justice Department, but someone who I think pledged to restore independence and public confidence in the Justice Department. And so there is a downside of bringing charges against a former president that could— uh, backfire you know, you know, here. But I just think that when you think about one of the main reasons we prosecute cases is to deter people from engaging in similar conduct in the future. I think that if Trump is allowed to get away with this and is not held accountable for his action, not only will it fail to deter others, but it might embolden others to try this again. And I think that's the reason that you just have to be a little bit brave here, maybe a lot bit brave here, and bring these charges, because otherwise I, I think the consequences are just too grave.
You know, it's the time of year when we're thinking about financial things, we're thinking about taxes, we're thinking about planning for the future. And if someone relies on your financial support, whether it's a child, an aging parent, or even a business partner, you need life insurance. And typically life insurance gets more expensive as you age. So it's smart to get a policy sooner rather than later. Policy Genius is your one-stop shop to find and buy the insurance you need all in one place. And getting started is easy. Click the link in the show description or head to policygenius.com and answer a few questions about yourself. In minutes, you can compare personalized quotes from top companies and find your lowest price. You could save 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius, and their team of licensed experts will help you understand your options and apply for the policy you choose. The Policy Genius team works for you, not for the insurance companies, and you can trust them to offer unbiased help and advocate for you at every step until you're covered. They won't add on extra fees or sell your info to third parties, and they've helped over 30 million people shop for insurance since 2014, placed over $120 billion in coverage. Policy Genius has thousands of five-star reviews across Google and Trustpilot, and you could be next. So head to policygenius.com to get your free life insurance, or as Joyce says, insurance quotes, and see how much you save. That's policygenius.com, or look for the link in our show notes. This week brought several examples of the consequences of politicians getting away with outrageous conduct. Putin took Crimea with no accountability, and now he's going for the rest of Ukraine. Trump once again seems to have skirted liability in New York. Governor Abbott and Attorney General Paxson of Texas got away with passing and so far preventing and joining SB 8. Like Putin and Trump, Governor Abbott and Attorney General Paxson are emboldened by their success and are going further. This week, Attorney General Paxton issued a definition that gender-affirming treatment is child abuse, and Governor Abbott has used that to order his Family and Protective Services to begin investigating all trans children who receive medical treatment that he calls sex change procedures, and to prosecute their parents as child abusers. This follows the refusal of even the Texas legislature to pass a law to do this. Based on his order, Abbott has also instructed all teachers, doctors, and caregivers to begin reporting any trans students they see or they will face consequences. District attorneys representing five of Texas's largest counties said they will defy this order and will not treat gender-affirming procedures for for transgender youth as child abuse. So let me start with you, Barb. Is the attorney general's opinion or any other factor that has been mentioned a legitimate basis for this order? Well, I think it's the kind of thing that you can use as a pretext or subterfuge to justify an order. Attorneys general, you know, play different roles in different states. And one of them is to issue what they call these advisory opinions. And that is, and the, you know, the Justice Department in Washington does this too through its Office of Legal Counsel. In the absence of legal precedent out there. They give these advisory opinions to the government uh, so that they can make a decision about whether they should act or not act in certain situations. But they're not binding legal authority. So if someone were to file a lawsuit, an attorney general's opinion is is really nothing. It's just guidance that can help uh, someone to uh, make a decision in government. And so I I don't think that anybody should see this as an obstacle to filing a lawsuit uh, that is violating parents' rights to make decisions on behalf of their children. Joyce, let's look at whether there's ever been a law that has identified a particular medical intervention as prosecutable child abuse, or whether there's a comparable child abuse strategy that could be used to hold parents and others liable and deprive minors of other medical care. Um, And of course, abortion comes to mind or uh, any kind of drug intervention. 
Yeah, so, you know, first, I think it's important to point out that it's exceptionally rare. I don't want to say it never happens, but it's exceptionally rare to use surgery for children, especially young ones. And the standard medical practice involves using puberty-blocking drugs, puberty blockers, to prevent puberty because it can carry traumatic consequences for trans children. Uh, When you use the puberty blockers, you can keep those traumatic consequences from occurring. And, of course, that's one of the medical actions that this uh, move by the Texas folks is designed to prevent parents from using on behalf of their their kids. So the whole goal of that medical approach is to buy a little bit of extra time, to give children the opportunity to grow and to mature so that they can make their own decisions about what's right for them. That means that the entire predicate for this action in Texas, it's both misstated and And it's overstated. There's this sort of pretense, you know, that very young children are being mutilated by surgery, as the Texas governor uh, would would have us believe. And what's really happening is actually supportive medical care that's very different and very, I, I, I mean, it's just the thing that really annoys me about this, just to be honest about it, and I have good friends who work in this area in Alabama where it's not easy work to do. Medical opinions from a wide variety of of practitioners, including pediatric practitioners, is that puberty blockers, that that's the right way to go, that that's the smart, savvy way to go. And so by attempting to cut that off by threatening criminal prosecution, Texas is really trying to damage these children. Um, So, you know, this quote action by Texas, as Barb points out, it's based on a non-binding opinion issued by the attorney general. It's not a law. And so to the point of your question, this targeting of trans children, I think, is unique and and unprecedented. But I think other states will follow with similar statutes, particularly if there's not a quick legal action to cut it off. Well, um, I, I agree with you completely. And as the friend of parents with trans children, I know how mean this is. This is really cruel and is has actual psychological damaging impact not to allow this to happen. And I think a little later we can talk about some of the other states and things that have happened that uh, go to this. But first let's look, Kim, at whether this violates the privacy of medical decisions, the right to determine your own or your child's care in consultation with a doctor. Is it also, a first step to barring adults from having gender-affirming medication. So, I mean, the answer to the first part of that question, is it a violation of that right? Yes, it is a violation <laughs> of parental rights. You know, I look at it this way. So we're talking about two different things, just to be clear. The, this would create um, a, a law, a vigilante-style law, much like we saw um, with the abortion law, um, that's aimed at therapy treatments, hormone treatments that Joyce was talking about, and um, gender reassignment surgery. So let's talk about that second one first. Um, Gender reassignment surgery under the American Medical Association and all standards of, of doctors who would perform such a thing, the guidance is that it should not be performed on anybody who's under 18. So this is a law targeting something that does not happen. There are not children being mutilated. It is a fantasy. It is fiction that does not happen. Now, there is, as Joyce pointed out, hormone therapies that are given, things like uh, uh, puberty blockers and such, that do treat, um, help aid trans kids. But people, including people under the age of 18, are prescribed hormone therapies for any number of things. This doesn't just affect trans people. Um, you know, that there it could be it could be uh, prescribed in many ways to address everything from from uh, reproductive conditions to acne. Like this is it's so overly broad and it is the decision of a parent, a child and a doctor to be made together. So this totally tramples on that. What this law basically is saying that parents don't have the right to decide with their children and doctor what's right without the legislature saying so. That really does not sound like conservative values to me. And it certainly flies in the face to the arguments we've been hearing for the last two years when it came to decisions of whether you have to wear a mask or get a vaccine about how one's body is one's own temple and only they can control it. This is the exact opposite of that. 
But just two things to remember here. One, this is political. This is the governor trying to score political points in a really hateful way, something that we've seen all too many willing to do, whether it's with critical race theory, telling uh, lies about that or something else, because this is the kind of thing that gins people up, that really aggravates them. So the such uh, is the same with abortion. It really rallies up the conservative base, even though it's, it's done so in a repugnant way. It's also asking for a legal challenge because they see a legal challenge as politically good. First of all, they think they'll, they'll probably think they'd win it because the Supreme Court is so, uh, you know, unevenly tilted. Uh, But even so, even on the way, they see that challenge, it being in the headlines, in the news as a political win. They are putting politics, using these trans kids uh, for political pawns. And that's really, that's really repugnant. It certainly is. And you mentioned um, the Texas abortion law, vigilante law. Do you think the fact that that hasn't been struck down emboldened Texas to do this? Yes. And I mean, we predicted this. We're going to see this is just the first couple in what I fear will be a slew of laws that puts in the hands of fellow people the right to to terrorize uh, people for doing what they should have a constitutionally protected right to do uh, from exercising their parental rights, exercising their rights to privacy in a really terrible way. And they it, it seems so far at least to have been successful. So there's really nothing stopping them from doing it in another way. And this one just feels so terribly. I mean, what people are going to be watching kids? How do you even know a kid is trans, first of all? And are they going to be watching, basing it on what? Reporting parents yeah. for doing what? I mean, they're going to be turning their their turning into spies for their neighbors. This is just, I, I can't even believe we're talking about this. It's really horrific, but I think it's only going to get worse. Well, in fact, as it turns out, um, and Joyce, let's look at this, Tennessee has passed five anti-trans laws. 2021 surpassed 2015 as the worst year for anti-LGBTQ legislation, with at least 22 anti-LGBTQ bills enacted into law. And what I worry about that is that this is the start of a big rollback of rights in general, and with a 6-3 court, that this could really be a big problem. Uh, What do you think, Joyce? I I think that you're right and that Kim's right. And, and, you know, I'm deeply concerned about this. We're lawyers, so we think the solution to these problems can sometimes best be found by litigating and using the courts to protect people's rights. And I suppose we're going to have to see what happens in this area. It will be very novel in some ways, but I know that the civil rights groups that work in the area of gender uh, and sexuality, that they're gearing up uh, to sort of fight this sexual identity battle in court. But there's risk in this litigation, Jill, and I, I wonder if you've thought about this as we look at what's going on in Texas, because, you know, to bring a lawsuit, there has to be an actual case and controversy, a, a real mm-hmm. problem that's going on, and you've got to have standing to be a party, uh, to be a party in a lawsuit. And that means, in essence, that some transgender child in Texas and their family has to expose themselves to bring this lawsuit and that means that Texas, with all of the coercive force that it sets out in this me- this memo, could attack that family, even to the point of trying to take the child away or deny the child medical care while the litigation is ongoing. So it seems to me that any litigation in this area is going to be extremely risky. Yes, I've thought about it. and. With horror, I would say, and I celebrate the district attorneys in the five counties that have said, we will not enforce this. And that doesn't mean that the others will. They haven't spoken out. And I'm hoping that they, too, will see the cruelty of denying the medical treatment and the cruelty of possibly suing any parent to lose custody of their child for allowing their child to be who that child is. Uh, So, yes, it's a really bad circumstance, and hopefully Texas will be stopped and Tennessee and all the others that are going to follow suit, and hopefully we'll have a reversal on the Supreme Court from 6-3 to 6-3 the other way, and uh, we'll be able to protect the rights of everyone in America.
It's no surprise to anyone who listens to the podcast that we're huge fans of HelloFresh. Jill, what have you been making this week? Oh, I've had just the best meals. The best part of it is that every night that I use HelloFresh, it's like from a different um, type of food. I can combine one week Mexican food with Italian food, with American food, with seafood, and all of them look restaurant fresh. They look like they're beautifully prepared and laid out on the plate. I feel so proud of myself when I do it. And it's such good relaxation to follow the recipe the way they lay it out. But in addition with HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre-proportioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. HelloFresh offers 50 menu and market items to choose from every week, including veggie, fit and wholesome, family-friendly, and gourmet options, providing plenty of variety. And this season, you can warm yourself up from the inside out with limited-time recipes inspired by cozy classics from around the world, like beef tenderloin and cheese fondue, or miso sesame shrimp and bacon ramen. I love that. I love the ramen. They are amazing. And we love that you can easily customize your order on the app in minutes with fresh, high-quality ingredients that go from the farm to your kitchen in less than a week and all delivered right to your door. You know, the personalization is a new thing in HelloFresh, and it's really been terrific where you can change the protein so that, you know, it's a meal that you like, but you'd rather have chicken instead of having beef. It makes it really easy. Um, so don't wait to get started. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Sisters16 and use the code Sisters16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. That's HelloFresh.com slash Sisters16 and use code Sisters16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts or get the link to America's number one meal kit in our show notes. And now we get to our favorite part of the show, which is answering questions from our listeners. If you have a question for us, please email us at sistersinlawatpoliticon.com or tweet using the hashtag sistersinlaw. If we don't get to your question during the show, keep an eye on your Twitter feeds throughout the week. As best as we can, we get on and we answer as many of your questions as we have time to. So first up, uh, we have actually, I'm going to combine a couple questions here um, on the issue of Russia. Russia and Ukraine. One is from Logan in Austin that says, can Putin be tried for war crimes? And another from Just Looking AR uh, says, can you explain the legality of seizing assets of Russian oligarchs and the sanctioning of Russian banks and going after Russian assets in the U.S.? How does that work exactly? Well, I'll start with the war crimes question. Uh, Obviously, the devil is in the details, but if there's a finding that Putin has committed war crimes, he can be charged and tried in the International Court in The Hague, just like other war criminals have been. Those charges are usually fairly, fairly serious charges. For instance, genocide is one of the crimes against humanity that can be charged in that way. I think it's too early to know definitively whether or not there will be an effort to charge uh, Putin Uh, And we'll have to wait and see what happens. So, Joyce, from where I come from, we say the Hague, not the Hague, but okay. That's one of our. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I'll start on the second half of the question about seizing assets. And that has actually already started because it was announced today at a press conference that assets were being seized, including those of Putin himself. And that is in an effort to make this real for the oligarchs and Putin in terms of the consequences of their illegal invasion of an independent country. 
And they have the ability to do this based on really broad executive authority uh, when it comes to foreign assets. In fact, the Treasury Department uh, under federal law can take really sweeping action like this uh, against foreign assets and foreign debt um, in if countries uh, do things like invade <laughs> invade other countries. So there is a strong legal support for the president's ability to do that. And that's why he was able to do it so quickly. Okay. So we also have a question uh, from Robert in Canada, which says, what are the ethical and legal standards that govern the practice of lawyers, particularly defense lawyers, when it comes to legal practices? I guess the real question is, does anything go particularly for defense attorneys uh, in representing a, a client? I, I'll, just the long and short of that is no, anything does not go. <laughs> lawyers are licensed. It's one of the licensed professions. And we have to adhere to not only all kinds of standards from continuing legal education uh, to uh, ethical standards that we have to uh, adhere to. Otherwise, we lose our licenses. And defense attorneys, uh, despite what you may see on TV, they have to do things um, like, you know, they can't knowingly misrepresent something to the court that they know not to be true. Um, yes, they can defend their clients um, zealously. In fact, they really should. Every defendant deserves a strong defense, but they cannot do so by lying, by consenting concealing evidence, by uh, doing anything essentially that is unethical. So each state has an attorney registration and discipline commission and has rules of conduct, uh, code of ethics. And that's, for example, what led to disbarment proceedings against Rudy Giuliani was for lying in court right. and misrepresenting in documents that you file with the court. That's a no-no in every single state. And that's how you get held accountable. But, you know, one thing that I will say is that those procedures can be somewhat lax, and sometimes lawyers are hesitant to discipline other lawyers. It can take a long time and then look like a slap on the wrist. I think um, something that's important in this area is for there to be more transparency. If we want people to have confidence in the integrity of the legal system, then when it comes to ethics and disciplining lawyers when they uh, go off the reservation, then as a community, we as lawyers have an obligation to be more transparent and clear about how that process works. And I think we've seen a little more energy in that area uh, post-Kraken. So I think people see how, um, <laughs> how terrible it could be. Post-Kraken. And our final question is from Kevin. How do you cope with men who insist on mansplaining? What has been the most egregious example of this in your careers <laughs> thus far? I will, you know, it's not even my career. I will, I will name him. But once a friend of mine who is still a friend, I forgave him. Um, mansplained me directions to the Women's March in Washington. I kid you not. <laughs> like I, th it was. Ju I was just like, what are you doing? Like. Do you hear yourself? Um, that's one of my favorite examples. But how have how have y'all been mansplained to? I mean, it's constant, right? And it's incessant. Twitter is one of my favorite places where it happens, but it happens in daily life all the time. But I'll, I'll tell y'all, my favorite case of mansplaining didn't happen to me. It happened to my neighbor, Sarah Parkak. Sarah is an archaeologist, and she's the, the woman who pioneered the use, it's sort of over my head, of GPS locating to figure out where to dig in Egypt. So she's a big deal in the world of archaeology. And she had responded to somebody on Twitter who had asked a question about Egyptian archaeology. Archaeology, and she, you know, sort of answered in a very quick form. And then some, some man sort of said, you know, so, something along the lines of, well, little lady. Um, and he was not prepared for Sarah, who didn't really feel the need to be polite and just very distinctly in tweet after tweet took him down. And I thought it was well done. And I thought that there was a lesson in that. You know, my tendency as a somewhat nice Southern woman, I try to hide my, my Angelino roots when, I, when I'm um, doing this. I, I just try to let it go. I try to just ignore it and move on. And I think sometimes it's worth a good confrontation. You just have to have at it. As we say back home, he, well, paraphrasing it, he messed around and found out. Yes. <laughs> Bless his heart. Yes. The, the only example I can think of was a man backed up into the side of my car and jumped out and said, oh, it's your fault. <laughs> and 
I said, oh, really? Uh, how is that? And he started with this ridiculous thing. I said, well, let's just call the police. He said, well, no, why don't we just exchange cards and then, you know, we can handle this without, you know, going to the insurance company. And I said, sure. And I pulled out my card and I handed it to him. And he took one look and he went, oh, you're not that Jill Weinbanks, are you? And I said, yes, I am. He said, okay, how much do you want me to pay? <laughs> so, <laughs> it had a good outcome. Thank you for listening to Hashtag Sisters in Law with Barb McQuaid, Jill Wine Banks, Joyce Vance, and me, Kimberly Atkins Store. You can send your questions by email to sistersinlaw at politicon.com or tweet them for next week's episode using hashtag Sisters in Law. Go to politicon.com slash merch to buy our brand new women's tea. And please support this week's sponsors, Honey, Policy Genius, and HelloFresh. You can find their links in the show notes. Please support them as they really help make this show happen. And to keep up with us every week, follow hashtag Sisters in Law on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen and please give us a five-star review it really helps others find the show see you next week with another episode hashtag sisters in law it i i wore a puffy coat the whole time i was in california seriously seriously yes and it was rainy it was horrible it was pathetic but it, Mm. it was it was it was an amazing event and i was speaking for planned parenthood of orange county and san bernardino and they had asked me very nicely if I would auction off one of my pins. And I had a pin that I had two of. So I said I would. And it went for $1,500. <gasps> and wow. I, had, I had the second pin with me. And at that price, I said, I'm going to take the pin I'm wearing off of me right now. And if the person who bid $1,450 will go to $1,500, you can have this pin. If you will stay with me, I have a hit. <laughs> and I have to have a pin to wear on television. I yeah. cannot go on tonight without the pin. I'll make sure they I get went, it to you. Yeah. We'll add $500 to be with you while you do the filming. <laughs> so, I mean, it was like, it, it was amazing. So it raised that's a lot hilarious. of money. Oh, Isn't that great? Fantastic. But that's really now awesome. I miss the pin. I miss it. And I went online hoping I could find something similar, and I can't. I mean, I have to keep oh, looking. No. But Is the it women who eagle? bought it were. It is an eagle, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I found a similar one that I ordered, but it's not nearly as cute and nice. Um, and oh, I do Jill, have... Oh, we'll find you a good eagle. Yeah. Don't worry. Yeah. It'll come back well, to you. Well, I, I, I have... Um, Congresswoman Jackie Spears sent me a larger version of the one that I auctioned. So oh. that will now be my go-to eagle. That's your eagle. That's and, fantastic. And of course, it's very special because it's from her. So I'm Is it like that, that one that Lady Gaga wrote it, wore at the inauguration? Remember, she had that huge one. Are I you loved kidding? it. I have a huge one. It's not as huge as hers, but I do have a huge one. But you really have to have the right thing on to wear that because it takes up literally... Well, a but, lot large part of the <laughs> possible well, material on my chest. If it's from the inauguration, maybe we can find the. Remember Aretha Franklin's hat? Then maybe we can find a version yes. of that that you can wear with it. So, it you know, amazing. you'll be making a full inaugural statement. Oh, All right. my God. Shopping that would be trip fantastic. For sisters in law, we're on. <laughs> <laughs> it would be great. It would be great. <laughs>